nice cup of hot tea. And before sipping, you notice a different aroma. It smells kind of organic. It smells like your lawn. Chances are that's not a special aromatic flavor of tea, but actual lawn grass trimmings in your drink, and you have been the victim of food fraud. In a previous episode of the Knife and Fork Show, we talked about the growing incidence of fish fraud, where consumers order an expensive species of fish only to be served something else. Well, food fraud is not limited to seafood. Whether it's due to the bad economy or just some unscrupulous people looking to increase their profits, there are a growing number of incidents where one food ingredient is being substituted for another. Sometimes it's dangerous. In one recent well-publicized event, one of Great Britain's largest supermarket chains was found, thanks to DNA testing, to be serving horse meat in some of its hamburgers. A group that has recently taken steps to combat food fraud is the United States Pharmacopoeial Convention, or USP. And here with me from that organization is Dr. Marcus Lipp, Director of Food Standards. Dr. Lipp, tell us about this database. What is it and how is it used? USP published a food fraud database on the internet. It's publicly available for everybody to peruse. And it is a collection of information from scholarly articles written by scientists and also the um, media articles, more substantive media articles that document food fraud that has been occurred. It covers a time period predominantly between 1980 and 2012, but there are older and, and more recent examples in there too from food fraud. So you have somebody on staff or maybe a couple people on staff who are perusing these journals and newspaper articles and just collecting this information and entering it in this database and, and formatting it in a way that people can kind of get something meaningful out of it. That would be right. USP publishes the Food Chemicals Codex, which is a collection of, of standards for what a food ingredient is supposed to be in its purity and identity. And of course, for our understanding, uh, we also have to know what can go wrong with such a food ingredient. So we are constantly perusing uh, the information sources for what has been published on a given food ingredient that can go wrong in order to write standards that are precise and specific enough to prevent right. this from happening. So one kind of led to the other. Exactly. It's yeah. complementary. Um, recently, you've added 792 new records to your food fraud database, growing it by 60%. Correct. Uh, it's a big jump in, in content. Uh, what are the most common food types for which other ingredients are being used? What are the, what are the, where are you seeing the, the most prevalent incidents of food fraud? It, it, it might be fair to backtrack for one second and, and just make a statement that Actually, the food that we can enjoy here in the United States, as well as in other developed countries, is by and large very safe. We do have the luxury to enjoy an abundance of food and safe food. However, that doesn't come out of nowhere. It was the vigilance of industry, and consumers, and regulators that led us to the food safety where we are right now. Now, that does not prevent uh, criminals from trying to um, cheat the system, if you want, to cheat the consumer eventually. And so those uh, are subject for research and subject to publications. And there were a number of uh, those reported in our database. Right. Amongst which is extra virgin olive oil, amongst right. which We've all seen, I think, videos or, or things about extra virgin olive oil and how um, uh, the scam artists will actually replace one with the other. Right. What are they putting in there instead of the uh, extra virgin olive oil? It could be just normal olive oil. It could be other vegetable oils. Um, I think the important part to remember about food fraud is not whether it is just lower grade olive oil that substitutes extra virgin olive oil and we are just getting frauded out of money. It is only the food fraud, the adulterer, the criminal who commits that act that will actually know what happened. So whether it's melamine and milk powder as it happened in China. Right, and very high profile case exactly. from 2008. In 2007, 2008, uh, that uh, suffering a lot of babies still from kidney problems related to that incident. Before that, wheat gluten that killed a lot of pets, even here in the yeah. United States. Same principle. It may have not been for intentionally harming the consumers. Most adulterers are in there for repeat business. They would like to sell their products, right. of course, and not get caught. But as they're not communicating what their activities, nobody has an ability to evaluate what happens. So food safety will collapse to the point of the adulteration, and only the adulterer and the ethic and the knowledge of the adulterer will determine whether public health is impacted, whether consumer health is impacted. Now, if a uh, food company, a manufacturer, uh, really wanted to get to know this food fraud database, it's, <coughs> you say it's available for free, 
I was going to give right. the website uh, www.foodfraud.org. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have about 2,000 records in right. there, and it's a free text search. So and they can search by topic. They can look up olive oils, for example, yes. and, and look at all the incidents of, of fraud involving olive oils. Correct, and with filtering possibility to narrow down the search results. So it's a very intuitive user interface. Uh, we, we thought it, it is helpful to regulators, to industry, and potentially the consumers to enter into informed discussions, to have a quick uh, access to a vast uh, amount of data, what has ever been reported of going wrong with a specific food ingredient, which might be relevant with the increased globalization we have, with increasing complexity in food formulations that um, will then aid everybody in the food supply chain to make a quick assessment about potential hazards that need to be considered. Now, I know you guys developed the database, and, and I don't know if you can give this kind of advice beyond the database, but. Is there anything you could tell a, a, a food manufacturer or maybe a consumer to avoid being victimized by this kind of fraud? I think it would be important to um, say that it's actually f food safety, as high as it is right now, will require ongoing vigilance. It will require ongoing vigilance from industry, from regulators, and also from the consumers. So for, food, for the consumers, uh, there is the old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, maybe it is. So if something appears on the shelf for a quarter of the price and everything mm -hmm. else is four times as high in price, maybe that could raise an eyebrow or two. Um, but also then there is the um, other information sources such as USP's Food Fraud Database that uh, people, buyers, purchases from industry or others in the industry can consult to get a quick overview if they were to source a certain ingredient they have no experience with what potentially can go wrong. What's the chemical breakdown of that ingredient? What should it be? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks to Dr. Lip for appearing twice on the Knife and Fork Show. See you again soon. Uh -huh.